Welcome everyone to the Cantor Arts Center and the Anderson Collections Art Break with Student Guides. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before I introduce myself, I want to acknowledge that the two museums and Stanford University sit on the ancestral and unceded land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. It is important that we honor the traditional stewards of the land and recognize the ongoing process of colonialism. I am Eklund Ho, a junior double majoring in English literature and art history. Today, I hope to speak to you about Julia Margaret Cameron's photography. Please feel free to submit any questions and comments that you may have through the chat function throughout the event. I look forward to reading and addressing them. Cameron had been a pioneer of the photographic medium. She began her creative practices at age 48 and produced photographs until her death in 1879. She photographed many luminaries of Victorian England from poets like Lord Alfred Tennyson and Robert Browning to the naturalist and biologist Charles Darwin. Although she photographed many famous men who frequented her residence at Freshwater, I want to speak specifically about her photographs of two women and the ways in which her techniques resonate with or may be retrospectively elucidated by her great niece Virginia Woolf's writing. The title of my talk comes from a quote by Cameron, whereby she states, take my lens, I bequeath it to my descendants. Woolf certainly does. We need to think no further than the photographs that she took to accompany her mock biography, Orlando. But I would argue that Wolf took up more than the camera itself and inherited Cameron's capacity to witness miracles in the everyday, which I have loosely referred to as Wolf's mysticism, a la Jane DeGay's book on Virginia Wolf and Christian culture. I would like to begin with a quote from Walter Benjamin whose essay on the work of art in the age of its technical reproducibility has been seminal in the theoretical considerations of photography and film. He writes, the stripping of the veil from the object, the destruction of the aura is the signature of a perception whose sense for the sameness in the world has so increased that by means of reproduction, it extracts sameness even from what is unique. Benjamin uses the veil and the aura analogously to denote the semblance of distance established by an object's distinctness and singularity. Benjamin conceives of photography as a revolutionary medium that eliminates the aura, but his idea is complicated retroactively by Cameron, who while embracing photography's potential for reproducibility, still aimed to preserve the mystery that surrounded the sitters. Her soft focus and printing practices, while grounded in the medium, defied the stripping of the veil that Benjamin deemed photography's precondition. She aimed to join the eternal and immutable with the ephemeral, fugitive, and contingent, allowing numinousness to pervade a medium of replication. Julia Margaret Cameron is known for her soft focus photographs. As you may see in this image of Christabel, her photographs lack the crisp and sharp outlines that we expect conventionally of photography. To see as if through opera glass, to use the words of Anne Thackeray. Christabel carries an absent look. She is a specter who looks at once past and through you. Her face is so smoothed out by a diffuse luminosity that she melts into the background. It is as though we are looking at her through a milky and translucent film. Although Cameron's soft focus began as an accident when she first took up photography, her artistic intuition led her to seize the expressiveness of the murky pictures. She recollects in an autobiographical fragment, uh, Annals of My Glass House, my out of focus pictures were a fluke. That is to say that when focusing and coming to something which to my eye was very beautiful, I stopped there instead of screwing on the lens to the more definite focus, which all other photographers insisted upon. 
she actively refused a scientific and documentary clarity for the ambiguities and multitudes that we hold. Her photographs manifest what Virginia Woolf describes as a luminous halo, a semi-transparent envelope surrounding us from the beginning of consciousness to the end in modern fiction. Akin to Wolf's renunciation of gig lamps, Cameron's soft focus photographs evince a varying and diaphanous spirit that permits everyday encounters to be perceived as miracles. Cameron's photographs capture what Wolf would eventually term moments of being, wherein she feels that she is lying in a grape and seeing through a film of semi-transparent yellow and experiencing the purest ecstasy that she can conceive. The film in Wolf's statement materializes through the blurriness of Cameron's images. The sitters appear to the viewers as though through a veil, the veil of uniqueness, mystery, and rapture. The, the first photograph from Cantor's collection that I hope to discuss is Cameron's portrait of Julia Jackson, Cameron's niece and one of her favorite models. Some of you may also know her as Virginia Woolf's mother and the inspiration for Mrs. Ramsey in Woolf's novel, To the Lighthouse. Jackson was renowned for her classical beauty. Her second husband, Leslie Stephen, Woolf's father wrote in mausoleum book, Julia's beauty was conspicuous from her childhood, and as she grew up, she was admired by all who had eyes to see. She was a muse for many artists and was treated as a metaphor or an allegory. Her speech startled the spectators who admired her as they would a statue. Elizabeth Robbins recounts for Virginia Woolf I remember your mother was the most beautiful Madonna. She would suddenly say something so unexpected from that Madonna face, one thought it vicious. In this particular print of Jackson, Julia Margaret Cameron flipped the negative in the print frame so that the reversed image would be rendered in a softer focus and the chiaroscuro as contrast of light and shadow would be enhanced. As you can see from the four images on the right, Julia Jackson disappears into the darkness with each reversal. The image that the cantor holds is the first reversal of the original Julia Jackson portrait, the top right image in the sequence. In contrast to Benjamin's concern about the veil being stripped or lifted, Cameron produced and held up veils in front of Jackson's face to make her inaccessible and inscrutable to viewers. Jackson haunts but eludes the viewer's imagination. Her soft focus photography and her reversal of negatives in the print frame leave us echoing Lily Briscoe from To the Lighthouse. 50 pairs of eyes were not enough to get around that one woman with. The second photograph from Cantor's collection that I would like to share with you is the mountain nymph, Sweet Liberty. The sitter of the photo had been Mrs. Keen, a model for Edward Byrne Jones. The title of the print is an allusion to John Milton's poem, L'Allegro, which reads, haste thee nymph and bring with thee jest and useful jollity, quips and cranks and wanton wiles, nods and becks and wreathed smiles, sport that wrinkled care derise and laughter holding both his sides, come and trip it as you go on the light fantastic toe. And in thy right hand lead with thee the mountain nymph, sweet liberty. Mrs. Keen's wistful expression, however, misaligns with the jubilant tone of Milton's poem, if she were a nymph, the movement in her hair suggests that she is pausing momentarily during her escape from a satyr. She is Daphne the moment before Daphne turns into a laurel at the hands of Apollo. 
rather than an illustration of Milton's poem, Mrs. Kean is better suited to Cameron's own poem on a portrait in which she writes, here we have eyes so full of fervent love that but for lids behind which sorrows touch doth press and linger, one could almost prove that earth had loved her favorite overmuch. A mouth where silence seems to gather strength from lips so gently closed that almost say, ask not my story, lest you hear at length of sorrows where sweet hope has lost its way. And yet the head is borne so proudly high, the soft round cheek so splendid in its bloom. True courage rises through the brilliant eye and great resolve comes flashing through the gloom. Cameron's poetry, like her photography, asks for the sitter's story without guaranteeing understanding. She hopes to collect the tales of Anon and Judith Shakespeare, like Wolf does in A Room of One's Own, stories of sorrowful models and servants that to another may be reproducible and all too common, but to her as luminous and deflects transparency. She attends to the uniqueness of each sitter while registering the impossibility of capturing them. Reflected in Mrs. Kean's penetrative gaze that communicates only the unutterable. When Cameron allows a veil to descend before her sitters, she does not aim to render them anonymous. That would be contrary to her production of their portrait in the first place. Rather, she insists on the ineffable in a medium that seems to promise perfect knowledge. As I wrap up our talk today, I want to show you one final image from Cantor's collection that demonstrates modern photography's inheritance of Cameron's attitude, of someone taking her lens. This is an image of Imogen Cunningham's Magnolia Bud. Cunningham was a member of the California-based group of 64. And although the group's mission and techniques appear to be the antithesis of Cameron's, as they are dedicated to sharp focus renditions of simple subjects, the motivation behind their practice is evocative of Cameron's and Virginia Woolf's mysticism. To see the world as though through a veil of mystery and in the words of Woolf, to feel simply that a chair, that's a chair, that's a table, and yet at the same time, it's a miracle, it's an ecstasy. Thank you so much for tuning in to the talk. I would be more than happy to answer any questions at this time. So please feel free to enter them through the chat function. And um, I look forward to seeing and hearing from everyone. Um, Emily asks, did Cameron generally only photograph young women? Did she also have other subjects? And yes, um, Cameron, although Cameron did photograph young women very, very often, especially as prototypes for either mythological figures or uh, the Madonna, she did also have photographs of older women, although the older women sadly tend to be more anonymous. For instance, in Cantor's collection, there is a print titled Portrait of a Woman, and she appears to be middle-aged, but there's very little information about her. Whereas for the younger sitters, there generally is, um, there are generally more records about whether they have sat for other painters or in the case of Julia Jackson, who has been a muse for just about everyone. And yes, uh, she also photographed many, many famous men. It was just that I had 
decided to focus on women in this talk, but even within Cantor's own collection, we have her portrait of the poet laureate, Alfred um, Tennyson. We have her portrait of Robert Browning, of Charles Darwin. And her, in fact, she is probably more famous for photographing famous men who had been in her, uh, who had been in her circle at Freshwater. But I, I think her portraits of women are especially incredible because of the looks of inscrutability, for instance, and mystery, whereas perhaps the men's celebrity um, had contributed to an undercutting of these same sentiments. Um, Tian Zhao asks, these, uh, these photos all have dark backgrounds. Did she take photographs with other backgrounds? Yes, she also did. Although she often used a black drape over most of her, uh, behind most of her sitters, there have definitely been many images in which she took it in possibly her garden, where there is more of a natural background with flowers jutting around the sitters for her more allegorical images. I would say, it's particularly interesting to see the images where the background is not perhaps just drapery because in, for instance, another image at Cantor's collection, a portrait of Mary Hillier, who was um, Cameron's parlor maid and also one of her favorite models, uh, Mary Hillier sits in front of um, a patch of plants and flowers, but what's funny is that the flowers appear rather artificial. So even when she is, well, even when she chooses not to put sitters in what appears to be more of a studio setting, although it would really just be in her home with some drapery behind the sitter's back, um, there, is, there is quite an artificiality even when the photographs aren't taking place um, within her homemade studio. <laughs> Um, Josie asks, what about children in her work? Do they align with the inscrutability of the women or do you think they are different? That is a fantastic question. I would in fact argue that there is also that inscrutability because um, as some of you may know, uh, photography at that time still required a very long and extended period of exposure time. So for instance, uh, generally, for Cameron to photograph a sitter, they would have to sit still for three to seven minutes <laughs> for a photograph to work. So funny enough, um, in order to photograph children, especially younger ones, either Cameron would photograph them asleep with, you know, a Madonna looking over them, usually posed by Mary Hillier, or in the cases where the children have decided actually to sit still for three to seven minutes, perhaps out of boredom, <laughs> or uh, perhaps the long exposure time has dulled their expression, they also carry on a, lo a look of inscrutability. And um, although we don't have such a print in our collection, if you do a quick Google search, all her allegorical images of children show them to look rather morose and wistful, uh, much more wistful than they should be for their age. And I would say that it's, uh, of course, produced by her technique. And I would say that it causes the children as young as they are to align with a lot of these women in her work. Um, Mackenzie asks, have you taken any classes at Stanford that inspired your research into Virginia Woolf and Julia Margaret Cameron? And yes, there have been two fantastic classes that have uh, propelled me to this path. I had taken with Professor Alice Stavely in the English department, Virginia Woolf in the age of hashtag Me Too, um, which has been absolutely an incredible course that surveys uh, many, many works by Woolf. And uh, Professor Stavely is extremely knowledgeable and uh, taking that class has really, really just led to my fascination with Wolf as a writer. And what contributed to my research into uh, Julia Margaret Cameron had been a course on photography and literature by, taught by uh, Professor Sarah Hodling. And in, in that class, we did uh, analyze uh, Orlando. And for my final project, I actually decided to look into Julia Margaret Cameron, knowing that she was a photographer and 
that Wolf had, for instance, contributed to essays about her aunt, and she has written a play, Freshwater, it's hilarious, would recommend it as a read um, about her aunt. So I wanted to explore this link between photography and literature in terms of the Wolf and Cameron lineage. Uh, Teresa asks, given when she worked, she must have been a pioneer in the new, uh, in the field of photography. Were there others that did similar work? Yes. Um, she certainly was quite the pioneer in the field, especially because she had entered it so early on. And in fact, the, the person who had introduced her to photography to begin with, um, Sir John Herschel, he had been one of, uh, one of Tabit's close friends and he had shown Cameron one of the first Tabit types as it was coming out. So really they were on the, threshold of innovation and this technology as it was um, coming, as it was rising to popularity. And there were, there were many that did similar work as Cameron's. There was quite a preference for portraiture at the time, and of course also landscapes, but there were many um, portrait photographers, uh, many of which are in our collection, such as Oscar uh, uh, Ridgelander. But I would say that Cameron's work is rather unique for her soft focus. There have actually been uh, amateur photographers who have written in photo journals that it's, it's extremely difficult to replicate the soft focus that Cameron achieves, even if her techniques are known. And I think um, even though some of her friends in working with her and in communicating with her have achieved similar effects where their photographs are softer focus, there is something rather unique to especially Cameron's perception of women. I have found that some of Cameron's portraits of the more famous men may um, actually be quite similar to other photographer of the Times portraits uh, of these famous men, but I would say her her intuition for how women are imaged is quite unique. And, um, and even for her portraits of famous men, these men often write her and say, yours uh, is the favorite portrait that I have ever had of myself. Uh, Tennyson certainly said so. I would be happy to take more questions if they were to come in, but I also wanted to make sure that before our time ends, I want to mention that there are these art breaks with student guides that occur every other Wednesday. So uh, please feel free to join us again in the coming weeks. Um, the talks are all fascinating and um, I really, really appreciate the works of my peers. And also I would uh, like to mention that the Anderson collection sadly will be closed due to uh, construction and renovation of the building. So, but everyone, please feel free to come visit the Cantor um, with an appointment. Although the photographs of Julia Margaret Cameron are not on display at the moment, they can also be accessed via uh, the Cantor collection website online if you wish to take a closer look at her photographs. And um, sorry, one last question. <laughs> uh, Mackenzie asks, uh, she'd love to hear about the Cantor Scholars Project in relation to the talk. Um, so Cantor Scholars is a program that is sponsored by the Cantor Museum, which allows students to pursue research or creative arts or curatorial projects uh, related to works in the Cantor's collection. And I have been doing work on Cameron's photographs because I feel that um, there is a long overdue review of her work. A lot of scholarships and exhibitions related to her work had occurred really um, at the end of the 20th century. So around the 1990s. And I think there's been a hiatus in the interest, um, in interest in her works. And I think I, I firmly believe in her position as a pioneering and trailblazing photographer. And I think that her mysticism is something that is extremely, extremely 
important and evident, but is also rarely talked about. So in my own research, I am doing a lot of, as I, as I did in this talk, tying in her photography with um, a mysticism that is retroactively defined by Virginia Woolf. Well, thank you so much everyone for attending and for uh, sharing this space and time with me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the images of Cameron and also briefly of Imogen Cunningham. Um, but thank you so much for your time and I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>